Let me share with you an announcement while you're finding your places in the Word of God. Romans chapter 4 is where we are this morning. Romans chapter 4. We've had two messages already out of chapter 4. One about Father Abraham and one about King David. But we're back in chapter 4 for the final time this morning. And we want to share together verses 9 through 11. But while you're finding your place there in Scripture, let me share with you also an announcement that this coming Tuesday is the 10th of July already. And that means it's time for 10, 10, 10. And on the 10th of every month, we take 10 minutes at least to pray for missions and ministry. And then we fast a meal if we're able to do that. And then on the following Sunday, which is the 15th, next Sunday, we bring an offering for local missions and ministry, missions that are not covered with our regular church budget. We've been able to help a whole lot of ministries like that, a whole lot of mission causes. And uh, so I want to urge you to pray on the 10th this coming Tuesday, and then next Sunday will be the time for the end gathering for 10, 10, 10 for the month of July, if you will keep that in mind. Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's infallible and incredible word to us? Here's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 4, Paul writing under the inspiration of God's Spirit. He says this, in, or is this blessing only, only for the circumcised then? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. In what way then was it credited? While he was circumcised or while he was uncircumcised? Not while he was circumcised, but even before he was circumcised, while he was uncircumcised. That's the meaning of that verse. Look at verse 11. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith, while still uncircumcised. This was to make him the father of all who believe, but are not circumcised, so that righteousness may be credited to them also. Now may the Lord bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. One day there was a young man standing on the side of the road out in the country, and there was a car that rode by and stopped and then backed up. The guy rolled down the window, and the guy said, I'm lost. Can you tell me how to get to Highway 27? And the young man said, no, I don't know where Highway 27 is. And the man said, well, how about Highway 51? Can you tell me how to get to Highway 51? And the young man said, no, I really don't know exactly where Highway 51 is. I can't tell you how to get there. And then the man in the car said, well, what about Highway 74? Do you know that? How in the world can I get to Highway 74? And the young man said, well, I don't know that either. And then the man in the car said, you don't know much of anything, do you? And the young man said, I know one thing. I know I ain't lost. Well, I want to ask you this morning, do you know that you're not lost? Do you really have that assurance in your heart? One of the saddest things I can think of is the fact that so many people in our world and so many people in the state of North Carolina, even today, so many people in this area of Charlotte and Matthews, so many people are lost. And so many people are living lost. And so many people are dying lost in their sin. And the reason that makes me sad is because it's not even necessary. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and died on the cross he died for your sins, He died for my sins, He died for their sins, and there's no reason for anybody to be lost because Jesus has died for us. And everybody needs to be saved and everybody should be saved. Now sometimes we meet people who are really outspoken about their sins. They make no bones about it. They laugh about how they sin and how they commit sins. Maybe they joke about how much they drunk over the weekend or how many drugs they took or how many people they slept around with. If you work in a secular job place, I promise you, you'll hear conversations like that. And it seems like they're bragging and they're boasting about their sin. They're proud of it. Sometimes people even joke about hell. I had a young man tell me the other day. He said, what if I die and go to hell? What difference does it really make because all my friends are going to be there and we're just going to have one great big party? Wrong. There's not going to be any partying in hell. That's going to be a place of isolation and a place of desolation. It's going to be a place of pain. It's going to be a place of eternal punishment. And Jesus said there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth in a place called hell. No parties at all. Yesterday we were coming back from Gastonia on I-85 and about halfway back there was a vehicle that went by us 
And on the back was a sign. I promise you on the back of this vehicle. Not a bumper sticker, but a sign. A large sign on the back of this vehicle. And it said this, the party in hell has been canceled due to fire. Now, I want to remember that. Because the next time somebody says to me, I'm just going to have one great big old party in hell, I'm going to say, sorry, dude, listen, the party in hell has been canceled due to fire. It's not going to be happening down there at all. But so many people see proud of their sin. And that's a sad, sad thing. And yet at the same time, there's something that's even sadder to me. The saddest of all scenarios is not just the fact that so many people are lost and they're dying and they're going to this place called hell, but the saddest thing to me is for somebody to think that they're really saved because of something they've done or something that's been done for them, and they feel like they're really saved. They feel like they're on their way to heaven. They feel like if Jesus comes back again, they're A-OK. -okay. They're going to be fine. They feel confident about that, and yet the reality is they don't really know Jesus. And they're not really saved. To me, that's the saddest thing I can imagine. To think that you're saved. To really believe that you're saved. But in reality, you're not. And I believe there are a lot of folks who have their names on our church rolls who are in that situation. They think that they're saved, but they're really not. Now the Apostle Paul is writing about that situation in Romans chapter 4. That's really what he's saying. And basically what he says in Romans chapter 4, the verses preceding what I read in your hearing, the verses that come after, he's saying there are four things that cannot save us. Four things that people commonly believe in, but in reality they can't save us. As I go through these four things, see if you know anybody who's in that camp. They think because they've done these particular things, they're okay with God, God's okay with them. They're saved. They're on the way to heaven. See if you recognize anybody. Or maybe you'll see yourself in the reflection of the mirror of God's Word. And you'll realize that you've got a false sense of security that you thought that you were saved, but in reality, you're really not. Now, what are these four things that cannot save us? First of all, sincere religiosity will not save us. Sincere religiosity will not save us. Now in Romans chapter 4, we, we've already seen in previous messages, the Apostle Paul talks about two great heroes of Judaism. Two great leaders from the Old Testament, Father Abraham and King David. Father Abraham was the father of the Jews as a nation. But David was the father of the royal bloodline through whom the Messiah one day would come. And they're both outstanding leaders to Old Testament Jews and even to Jews to this very day. Now here's the thing about both of these men, Abraham and David. They both had their own form of religion and they were very sincere about practicing it. Now think about Abraham. The Bible says in the book of Genesis that Abraham came from Ur of the Chaldees. That's over in the area near Iraq, near Iran, the Middle East. That's the geography that we're talking about. And the Bible says that he came out of that area. area. God called him out. And the Bible teaches us that that area, Ur of the Chaldees, was a place of idol worship. They worshipped a multiplicity of gods, little g. They worshipped all kinds of idols. And so it's very likely that Abraham worshipped idols. That was his religion. But here's the question. Did worshipping all those idols and having that kind of religion, did that make him righteous, really, in the sight of God? I mean, he was religious, he was worshiping idols, he was sincere about his religion, but did that make him righteous in the sight of God? And the answer is, no, absolutely not. The Bible says, here in Romans chapter 4, that Abraham believed God, and when he put his faith in God, then he was declared righteous in the sight of God. Not one second before, but when he put his faith in God, that made all the difference in the world. Now, what about King David? When he sinned with Bathsheba, he committed three sins. And he broke three of the Ten Commandments. First of all, he coveted his neighbor's wife. That's a sin. That's one of the big ten, one of God's top ten, the Ten Commandments. And he broke that commandment. And then he also committed adultery with Bathsheba. That was a second infraction of the law of God. It was a second sin that he committed. And then thirdly, he plotted the death of Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, that was a third sin, murder. Now, two of those sins, two of those commandments that he broke, 
the idea of committing adultery, and then the concept of plotting murder, those two were capital offenses. And literally, David could have died for either one of those. He committed both. So he was worthy of death. And that was the teaching of his religion called Judaism. And he was very sincere about his religion. Now there's a Bible scholar by the name of John Phillips. And John Phillips says in the Old Testament sacrificial system where they sacrificed animals and they shed the blood over and over again every year, that there was no sacrifice for willful sin like adultery and plotting murder. And so literally what John Phillips is saying is this. David's religion of Judaism couldn't help him at all. It offered him no hope at all. There was nothing that David's religion could do to bring him out of that situation. No lasting forgiveness and no lasting salvation. And so he needed more than religion. And I've got news for you today. So do we. We need more than just religion. Now, I'm not very fond of religion. In fact, I believe that probably religion has sent more people to hell than anything you and I could name today. Religion is not a good thing. Look at Romans 4, 7. Here, the Bible quotes Psalm 32, a psalm written by David, when his sin with Bathsheba was open knowledge to everybody and it was exposed. And he wrote these words, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered by God. Those sins that have been forgiven by God because we've turned to Him. Not through religion, but through relationship. Another psalm written during that time, time is Psalm 51. And I want to read verses 16 and 17 to you from Psalm 51. David wrote in those two verses, For thou desirest not sacrifice. There are no sacrifices for these two willful sins, these two willful acts of disobedience. No sacrifice in Judaism at all. Else, David says, would I give it? Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart, O God, and that thou will not despise. When it comes to forgiveness of sin, we don't need religion. The world has too many religions already. What we need is a relationship. We need a relationship with the living God through His Son who gave His life on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. Now I run into a lot of people today and they say to me, well, Pastor Buddy, you know, there's good in all religions. I mean, you can name this religion and that religion and this is good about that one and this is good about that one and this is good about that one. And you know, there's a little nugget of truth in every religion. And I want you to understand, they write. They're absolutely right. That's why religion is so deceptive. There's something good about every religion, but it's not good enough. And there's an element of truth in every religion. But there's so many lies surrounding that little nugget of truth that's contained in every religion. It shouldn't surprise us that there's good in every religion. And there's a nugget of truth in every religion. Somebody put it like this a long time ago. They said even a broken clock is right twice a day. Amen? And even a broken religion, like all the religions of the world outside of Jesus Christ, even those broken religions can be right in some respects. Don't let that surprise you. That's part of the deception that Satan uses to deceive people and to send them to hell. Now, do you know what the word religion means? The word religion comes from a word which means to bind. And literally, when you and I become religious, without a living relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, we are bound by the principles and the practices of that particular religion, whatever it happens to be. We are bound. And the word means bind. B-I-N-D. And literally, religion puts people in bondage. Literally. It binds their mind. It binds their spirit. It binds them physically. It binds them emotionally. And people that are caught up in religion are living in literal bondage. That's what the word means. Listen to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 4 where Jesus talked about religion. And he said this, For they bind, B-I-N-D, there's that word, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. How different it is when we come to Christ. Because when we come to Jesus and we say, we want to have a living relationship with the living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We want to know God and we want God to know us. 
And we want to have a relationship through His Son, Jesus, who sacrificed His very life and shed His blood for you and for me. We want a living relationship, not a dead religion. Literally, when we say that, the Bible says that Jesus sets us free. And He liberates us and He removes the bondage from our lives. Whom the Son sets free is free what? Indeed. Free indeed. Now think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. You're bound up with all the cares of life, and you're bound by your religion. And I will give you rest. All of you take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy. It's not a burdensome thing. It's not binding you up. And my burden is light. That's what Jesus said. I'm not going to bind you up with all these rules and regulations and all these practices and principles. I'm going to liberate you and set you free. And so what we need is not a religion. What we need is a relationship. Now, if you think that religion will take you to heaven, you're going to be sadly disappointed. It's not going to be that way. The only way to get to heaven is through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father through Him. That's the only way it can happen. And so some kind of a religion, some kind of a religiosity is not enough. That will not save you and take you to heaven. That's what Paul says. Now here's the second thing. Self-righteousness will not save you either. Self-righteousness will not save you. When it comes to obtaining righteousness, we have two choices, basically. Number one, we can try to earn our own righteousness by good works. We can try to do nice things and good things and personal effort and all that. And we can try to earn our righteous standing before God. The other option is this. We can depend totally and utterly upon God to impute it to us, to give it to us through faith. It's either self-work or it's what God has already done for us. Those are the only two options. Now, Paul mentions both of these options in Romans chapter 4 and verse 6. I didn't read that verse earlier, but check it out. Romans chapter 4 and verse 6. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, the happiness, the joyfulness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. That's what he says in verse 6, without works. Now, once again, the word imputeth, we've already talked about that in previous messages from chapter 4. That means to credit it to, to put it on the account of, or in the account of. And the Bible says because of belief, because of faith, God imputes His righteousness to us. It's not something we can earn with good works. It's impossible to do that. And why is this man blessed? The man to whom God imputes or gives or credits righteousness because he no longer has to worry about trying to earn his own salvation or earn his own righteousness or to earn his own justification through good works. He doesn't have to worry about that anymore. And God says in his word through the Apostle Paul, it's not of good works. Now it's surprising to me how many people still believe that they are saved by good works. In fact, every other religion and every other cult in the world outside of the Christian faith is based on a work theology. Now think about it. If you and I could really earn our own righteousness by what we do, by doing enough good works and kind of stacking them up and building up our good works, if we could earn our salvation, why in the world would we need Jesus? And why in the world, if we could do it on our own, would Jesus have to come and to die? So what we need is not a religion based on good works and earning our own righteousness. What we need is a relationship where God gives us righteousness through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity is not a religion. When I was a college student, they had a course at the college I attended, and it was called Christianity as a World Religion. And I really hated that title. Because out of all the world religions, Hinduism and all the others, Buddhism, Islam, out of all the religions, Christianity is fundamentally different. Every religion that you and I can name says, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. But Christianity says, it is done. 
Jesus paid the price once and for all. And we can be righteous, not by trying to earn it from God, but we can be righteous because God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to you and me the moment we believe and receive Jesus Christ into our life and into our heart. Now here's one thing I've learned about people who believe you're saved by good works, and that is they never have the assurance that they're really saved. You know why? Because they never really know if they've done enough good works. If they believe that's the basis of their salvation, they're never really convinced, they're never really certain that they've done enough good works. Maybe they need to knock on one more door. Or maybe they need to hand out one more piece of literature. Or maybe they need to go to one more meeting. Or maybe they need to do one more good deed for somebody else just to be safe. They never really know. And here's something I've asked people who believe that you earn your salvation by your good works. And I've never gotten a satisfactory answer to this question. And the question is this. How many good works does it take to undo all the sins of the past? All the sins that you've committed. If you get saved at 15 or 18 or 20 or 35 or 55 or 65, when you get saved, how many good works, if that's the basis of salvation, does it take to undo all that sin from your past? And nobody's been able to tell me that. Nobody's been able to answer that question because there is no answer to that question. And then if you do get enough good works, if that were possible, and you stack up enough good works that you become righteous in the sight of God, but then you sin again after that, how many good works does it take to come back to God? And nobody has ever been able to answer that. And yet so many people are trying to earn their own salvation by doing good works here and good works there. And they feel like they're okay with God, not because they've been saved by grace through faith, but they think they're okay with God because they're doing all these wonderful things in the name of the Lord. That will not save you. Remember in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son? Here was a young man who rebelled against his dad. And he said, Dad, I want my share of the inheritance. I want my cut right now. And the Bible says that he went out into a far country and he wasted all of his money on riotous living. He just threw it away. He just wasted it living a life of debauchery and sin. Basically, that's what the story is of the prodigal son. And some of you may have a prodigal son or daughter in your family. It's heartbreaking. You've done your best to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You've done your best to point them in the right direction toward the will of God for their lives. And yet they've got a will of their own and they've made some very, very wrong decisions in life. And they're a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. And it breaks your heart. This young man was a prodigal and he went into a very far country. And then the Bible says he came to himself, thank God for that. And he came back to the father and basically what he was going to tell the father was this, hey, I've sinned against heaven, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy to be your son anymore, so I just want to be your servant. I just want to come back home again, and I want to be on the farm, and I'll just do the most mundane chores. I just want to be your servant. Well, as he was coming down the road, the father, according to the Bible, Luke 15, the Bible says the father saw him coming. Now, I believe that's because the father was looking for his son to come home. I believe he was waiting and anticipating that someday his son would come back to the things that he knew, the things that he'd been taught about the Word of God, the things he'd been taught about the love of God. He just believed that God would bring that prodigal son back home again. He believed in Proverbs, where the Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. He'll come back to it. He'll have an anchor for his soul. And this young man came back again. And the Bible says when he was a long way off, before he could share his speech or do any of the things he had planned, the father ran to him and he embraced him and he kissed him and he welcomed him. He put a signet ring on his finger. He put shoes on his feet. He put a robe on his back and he called him his son. And he said, i tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate. Now, I believe that every time somebody gets saved, we ought to have a party. We ought to celebrate because 
This one that was lost, this one, this one that was dead, this one that was blind, now they've been saved. They're alive again by the grace of God. Their eyes have been opened to the goodness of God. And we ought to celebrate that. Why? Well, the Bible says when one sinner repents, there's rejoicing in the presence of the holy angels in heaven. I believe that God wants us to throw a party when people come home to the Messiah. When they recognize Jesus as Lord and Savior, and yet we have people getting saved, and we kind of take it for granted. It's kind of old hat. Well, I did that years ago. And we ought to rejoice every time somebody says yes to Jesus Christ. And this father that represents God in this parable, he said, we're going to have a party. Well, the key figure in all of this is not the prodigal son. That's one aspect of the story. But there's another plot. And the other plot involves another character, the older brother. And this older brother was not happy with this party. And you can almost hear the violins in the background as he begins to complain. And he says, Lo, these many years have I served you. He said that to his dad. And never once transgress your commandment. Did you catch what this older brother said? He said, I've served you. I've worked. I've done all these things that you expect me to do. And you never threw me a party. And I've never broken one of your commandments. Liar. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that young man, the older brother, thought he was okay because of his good works. Good works and self-righteousness. They always go together. And people feel like they're earning their righteousness by doing good things. Now, we serve the Lord not in order to be saved. We serve the Lord because we are saved. And we want to glorify the one who saved us. And that's why we serve. That's why we stay in the nursery. That's why we teach Sunday school. That's why we're involved in vacation Bible school. That's why we visit the hospitals. That's why we go out on Tuesday night to share the gospel and to share the love of this church with people who have visited and people who need to have a church home. We do that not in order to be saved, but because... We are saved. So, we're not saved by religiosity. And we're not saved by self-righteousness. Here's another one. Symbolic rituals will not save you either. Number three. Three out of four. Symbolic rituals will not save you. Look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 9. Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also. Now, Paul's going to spend a lot of time in Romans chapter 4, and we won't go through all the details that he gives. And he's talking about this ritual, this symbolism of circumcision. Now, this was a major component of the Jewish religion. Originally, it was given to Abraham way back in Genesis as a sign of the covenant between Abraham and God. Over time, however, the Jewish people made it a spiritual status symbol. And literally, they got to the point by the time of the New Testament that they referred to themselves as the circumcision. They were circumcised. And they felt like that made them righteous in the sight of Jehovah God. And everybody else was the uncircumcision. And they broke down society into those two categories, the circumcision and the uncircumcision. Now, if anybody understood the spiritual significance of this ritual, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul, who's writing Romans chapter 4, knew about this because he was a strict Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of a distinguished body called the Sanhedrin court. And he says, according to his own testimony, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says this, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. And then in Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, he says this about himself. For you have heard of my conversion in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now this is Paul talking about himself. And he says the reason he persecuted the church he voted for Stephen, the deacon, to die, the first martyr of the church. He was arresting Christians, and who knows how many he really led to put to death. Nobody really knows. The Bible never records that total number. But he was persecuting the church. And he said, here's the reason why. Why? It was my Jewish zeal. 
my religious passion. I was circumcised. I was excited about being a Jew. And I felt this new message of Christianity was blasphemous. Here come the Christians. And they're preaching that Jesus died for our sins. And the way to be righteous with God is not by being circumcised or keeping rules and regulations or any of that. That's not the way to be saved. But the way to be saved is by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior into your heart and into your life. And the Jews, like Paul, were saying, wait a minute. We've been doing it this way all these years. We've been circumcising people. It's a sign of the covenant that we really belong to God. And you've got to be circumcised to really know God. That's the only way. And this message of the church, this new message, is blasphemous. And that's what Paul thought. Thank God. Paul met the Jesus he was persecuting on the Damascus Road. And it transformed his life. It changed him inside out. It changed his heart. It changed his spirit. It changed his mind. It changed everything about him. And I believe with all my heart that's normal Christianity. When we meet Jesus, we ought to become a new creation in Christ. And everything ought to change. And that happened with the Apostle Paul. And now he could write about Abraham. And he could say to the Roman believers, You know Abraham? He's the father of the Jewish nation. He wasn't saved because he was circumcised. In fact, he became righteous 14 years before he was ever circumcised. He was justified. He was declared righteous because he put his faith in the living God. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him. It was given to his account. It was rendered to him and reckoned to him that he was justified. He was righteous in the sight of Almighty God. Look at Romans 4.11. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while still uncircumcised, even before he was circumcised. Now it's amazing to me. That some people, in spite of all these scriptures, still believe that rituals really save them. And if you'd ask them today, are you saved? Are you on your way to heaven? They'd say, yes. And you'd say, well, why do you have that assurance? On what basis do you believe that? And they would say, well, because I did. And they'd fill in the blank with a ritual. They would say, for example, I've been through confirmation. And I know confirmation is meaningful to some people. But I want to tell you, that's not what saves us. It's the Jesus that we confirm by a personal profession of faith that saves us. It's not confirmation. They might say, well, I've gone through catechism classes. Or maybe they would say, you know, I partake of the Lord's Supper. Or maybe they would say, I've given to the church and I've done acts of benevolence. I help little ladies across the street even if they don't want to go. And I walk my dog every day. I make sure my dog has plenty of water. I am a good person. And because I'm such a good person, I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Or maybe they would say, I keep the Ten Commandments. Or I live by the golden rule. Or maybe they would say, I've joined the church. Or maybe they would say, I've been baptized. And somehow they equate that with salvation. Listen, folks, all of these things are symbols. All of these things are rituals. The only way to be saved is to have a relationship with with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, under any other circumstances, will come to heaven except by me. That's the only way. That's what Jesus literally was saying. A lot of people really feel like that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. I was doing a funeral a while back, and it was a graveside service. And always at a funeral service, I present the gospel, and I try to be balanced and fair, but share the gospel. For example, the reason it's important to share that is because you don't know who's there. Whether they're really saved or they've ever heard the gospel really in their life. And also it's a time when people stop and think about life and death and what lies beyond the grave. And so I present the gospel lovingly and as kindly as I know how. And on that particular occasion, it was the same thing. I shared the gospel. And after the service was over, there was a man who came up to me. And he said to me, I want you to know you did well. I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And then he said, but you did not preach the whole gospel. And I said, oh, my goodness. Did I leave something out? I didn't mean to. Let's see. I told him about the cross. I told him about Jesus dying. And I told him that you need to make a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ yourself. You need a relationship. Did I leave something out? He said, yes. You didn't tell them they have to be baptized 
in order to be saved. You have to be baptized in order to be saved. And I said, sir, the reason I left that out is because I don't believe it. And he said, why don't you believe it? I said, look at the thief on the cross. He was on the cross. He was dying, and justly so. He deserved to die, just like you and I deserve death and separation from God. But on his deathbed, literally on the cross, he cried out and said, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me where? Paradise. You're going to go. You're going to make it. Well, wait a minute. I can't get baptized. I can't pull these nails out of my hands. I can't pull this spike out of my feet. I can't be baptized. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because he had a relationship. Had nothing to do with baptism. Baptism is a symbol of what's happened in your heart. That's all it is. It's important, yes. It's a living testimony, but it will not save you. There's no power in water to wash away your sins. Just ask Pilate. He condemned Jesus to die, and then he began to wash his hands, and he said, I'm free of the blood of this man. Was he really? No. No. Because soap and water can't wash away your sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood, just like we sang about a while ago. One more thing. I told you there were four. Here's number four. Strict rules will not save you. Strict rules will not save you. Do you know how a lot of unbelievers outside these church walls look at us? They think that we're very judgmental, and they believe we're all about rules and regulations. I've told people before when they've asked me, what denomination do you belong to? And what denomination is your church? And I say, well, we're Southern Baptists. Didn't think a thing about it. But they have a negative reaction to that. Have you ever experienced that? And they say, oh, Southern Baptist, you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't go there, and you can't do the other thing. And they go through this whole litany of things that they've heard about Southern Baptists. And most of it's really not true. But they perceive the fact that we're all about thou shalt not and thou shalt. And normally in their mind, there are more thou shalt nots than there are thou shalts. And they perceive us as being all about rules and regulations. Now, one of the reasons that happens is because there are some churches, unfortunately, and all they preach about is what they're against. And they never tell people what they're for. Now, there are some things we ought to be against just because we're for some other things. There are some things that the church today needs to be against. For example, we need to be against abortion and all the millions of babies who have had their lives snuffed out. But you know why? It's because we believe in the sanctity of human life. That life is a gift of God. So we're against abortion because we're for life. We're also against people being under the influence of drugs and under the control of alcohol and things like that. We're against that. You know why? Because we believe what the Bible says, that people ought to be filled with, controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And you can't have it both ways. You either control by the Holy Spirit or something else, even legal prescription drugs that you abuse. And that's a major problem in our culture today. And even sometimes it invades our churches. So yes, we're against drugs and we're against alcoholism, but it's because we're for the Holy Spirit. We're also against homosexuality. Not the homosexual. We love them because God loves them. Jesus died for that homosexual. We need to understand that. That's the gospel. And if it's not for the homosexuals, then does it work for anybody else? Sure, they're living in sin. What they're doing, according to the Bible, is an abomination in the sight of God. But here's the reason we're against homosexuality. It's because we're for the sanctity of marriage the way that God ordained it. In the beginning, God said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife, and the two of them shall become one flesh, a union blessed by Almighty God. So yes, we're against some things, but we're also against them because we're for some other things. And the world needs to understand that. Look at verse 13. Romans chapter 4, verse 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, rules and regulations, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. We can't become righteous by keeping rules and regulations. And yet it's amazing to me how many people try to live that way. They become what we call legalists. 
And they have all these do's and don'ts, and they have all these rules and regulations they try to live by. And they really feel like in their heart of hearts, when you boil it all down, that it's those rules and regulations that make them right in the sight of God. Now, if anybody understood rules and regulations, it was the Apostle Paul. He was a Pharisee. They were meticulous about keeping all the rules and regulations. Now, the Pharisees really arose from 605 B.C. to 587 B.C. And Israel had been captured by the Babylonians and some of the Jews had been deported from the land. And they're out of the land. And then Cyrus, the king of Persia, Cyrus the Great, conquers Babylon and the Persians take over. And Cyrus says, hey, all you Jews, you can go back home again. And so they journeyed back in stages back to Jerusalem and back home to Judah. They went back to restore that land that was devastated. But then, here's what happened. They got back and they said, wonder why that happened to us. Wonder why God allowed us to go into captivity like that. Wonder what happened. What threw all of this into that situation? And then they decided it was because they had not kept the law of God. They had not kept God's law. And they said, this will never happen again to the Jews. And so a group of people arose called scribes. They're also called lawyers in the Bible. Woe unto you doctors and lawyers. That's the group that Jesus was talking about when he said that. They were the lawyers. And they hand copied the scriptures. We owe them a debt of gratitude for that because we can compare our Bibles to the ancient manuscripts and pieces and fragments that we have in some whole books and we can see the accuracy of the Bible that you and I carry. So we owe them a debt of gratitude. They did that right. But over the years, they became the interpreters of the law. And they began to establish rules and regulations based on their understanding of the law. And by the time Jesus came along, there was a group called the Pharisees. And they tried to live by the Ten Commandments, but they also tried to live by 613 rules and regulations every single day. Now, don't you know that would be a wonderful life? To get up every morning and say, okay, 613 rules and regulations. I can't do this, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. And you'd go down the list and you'd check off the things you did and then you would have to pray and repent about the things you didn't do. Because we don't want to go back into captivity with Babylon like we did in the past. We need to keep the law of God. And they had those rules and regulations. I was reading the other day about the Pharisees. Did you know in Jesus' time, they had 39 rules and regulations about Sabbath day observance on Saturday. 39 rules and regulations. Let me give you a couple of examples real quickly as we close. First of all, the rules that they live by said this. On the Sabbath day, you can't spit into the sand. Because if you spit in the sand, if it's soft sand, it may make a furrow and it looks like you've been plowing and that's not allowed because that would be work. So don't spit in the sand. Eh, can't do that. You know what else they said? They said you can't tie a knot in a rope on the Sabbath day. You're thirsty, it's hot like it is today, and you need a drink of water and you need to let that bucket down into the well, but you can't tie a knot because that would be what? Work. You can't do that. It's not allowed. But here's the twist in the whole thing. You can take a woman's girdle and you can put it on that bucket and for some reason that's okay. Now guys, I don't know, but I'm not sure we have girdles anymore. <laughs> so we'd be in trouble. Can't you see some guy saying, Ethel, bring me your girdle. I'm thirsty. That's the way it'd be. For some reason, that was okay. See how silly these rules are? In fact, one of the rules was this. You can't look in a mirror on the Sabbath day because you might see a smudge on your face or maybe a piece of hair that's not exactly where it needs to be. And you may be inclined to do something about it, but you can't do anything about it because that would be work. You can't do it. If you and I would go to Israel today, there are some kosher hotels, a lot of them in Israel, and if you go even to a five-star hotel, you will find something called a Sabbath elevator. If you go to Israel, don't you get on that Sabbath elevator. Let me tell you why. Because that elevator is going to stop at every single floor automatically. 
Because if you get in there and you push the button to the 15th floor, that would be what? Work. Can't do it. So if you get on the Sabbath elevator, it's going to stop at every single floor all the way to the top of the building and all the way back down to ground floor over and over again. Rules and regulations. I want to tell you something. Rules and regulations will not save you. I heard about a sign that was outside of a convent and the sign said this, no trespassing, no smoking, no skateboards, no bicycles, no chewing gum, no boom boxes, no talking, no laughter. Violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And then it was signed, Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> I don't think those sisters had much mercy, do you? I want to tell you something. It's not rules and regulations, folks. It's a relationship. It's all about Jesus. Do you have a relationship like that? If not, I want to invite you to give your heart to Christ. You can come forward and we'll share with you and talk about that. Or right where you are, you can just simply pray a prayer inviting Jesus to come into your heart and say, Lord, I believe that you died on that cross 2,000 years ago so that I can be righteous. Not that I can earn it, but Lord, you can give it to me through Jesus Christ. And I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And right where you're seated, you can accept Jesus and embrace him as your Lord and Savior this morning. Maybe today you realize that you are saved by grace. You're on your way to heaven. Thank God for that. But maybe you realize that you've kind of slipped into a legalistic mindset. And you're basing your salvation and where you stand with Christ on legalism, do's and don'ts and rules and regulations and rituals and all these other things that we've talked about. And maybe because of the rules and regulations you're living by, you become harsh toward other people who live differently. You're judgmental, just like the Pharisees were. Would you come today and say, Lord, liberate me and just help me to live in freedom, wonderful freedom spiritually in my heart and life and just love Jesus and just love people. Somebody asked me the other day, what's your goal for Mount Harmony Baptist Church? You know what I told him? I said, here's what God laid on my heart. He wants me to love him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. And then he wants me to love people in his name with his love. That's my goal, to love God more than I ever have and to love people more than I ever have. Wouldn't it be a wonderful church if we really did that? Wouldn't it be a wonderful community of faith if we just simply did that? It's all about not religion, not ritual, not rules and regulations. It's all about a relationship with Jesus and with each other. Would you stand with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we are so thankful and so grateful that, Lord, we can have a relationship with your son, Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that our righteousness comes through that. And we don't have to live by obeying rules and regulations or going through rituals and things like that. Lord, there's a reality that comes because of relationship. And Father, I pray that each one of us would have a good relationship with Jesus and a good relationship with each other. That we would love Him and love each other with the greatest of all loves, your agape love. And Father, bless this time of decision. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As the song begins.